Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, thanks for making the time. This seems really loud now, so... Uh, does that work? No. Okay, you want me to be loud. Okay, cool. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for making the time to come to the session. Uh, I'd like to talk to you about empathy-driven content strategy. Before that, a bit about me. That's me, I'm Kubert. Uh, everything I'm going to talk to you about, including the slide deck and the resources that I'm going to refer to, are all going to be available on my blog. Um, if you are on Twitter, I kind of practically live on that thing. Um, a bit about me. I work for Acquia. I'm a program manager within professional services. I've been practicing Agile now for just over 15 years, which makes me an old hat at Agile. Um, I've been I started my life with things like joint application development, RAD, rapid application development, DSDM, etc. before moving and finding my way into Scrum. Um, we're people, not resources, right? How many times are we referred to as resources? All the time, right? It just seems wrong. And I find myself occasionally, and I say occasionally, <coughs> making that mistake as well. So. I think we can. I think we did it. Uh, better? Oh, thank you. Very romantic now, Joe. <coughs> you and me, baby. Yes. <laughs> so, we're not resources, we're people. And likewise, our customers are people first, aren't they? But we always talk about our customers as this entity. You know, the user, the customer. And I say, let's drop that mindset and look at them as individuals, because that's what they are. And that's what empathy is all about. That's what connections are all about. I don't connect with my resources. I connect with people. I don't connect with my customers. I connect with the people. I have an example. I have a customer right here. I've never referred to Zen as a customer. Because he's not a customer. He's an individual. That's how you develop relationships. So we can all use a little bit of empathy, right? Especially in today's world. So content, moving on to the topic of the talk. Uh, what's the purpose of content? So we create content to create awareness about what we do. Like, for instance, on my blog, you have a whole raft of awareness about things that I'm interested in. On a business, in terms of the business content, you try and sell your services, you try and create the awareness, you try and create the opportunity by introducing people to what they do, or what you do, that they might be interested in. So it's about education. It's also about building trust. So my blog, all, all the material on my blog, for instance, on Agile and my experiences, builds that level of trust that this guy knows what he's talking about when it comes to agility, for example. But what's the purpose? What does content lead to? Content leads to experience, and that's what really matters. Content is a means to an end. The end is kind of the journey, the experience you're going to have on that journey. It's the experience part of the content that determines whether or not you're going to get converted, right? It's not the content that converts me into buying your product or uh, clicking on the contact form so that I can engage with your services. It's the experience I have engaging with the content that converts me into clicking onto the contact link or pulling something into the shopping basket. So, likewise, the experience determines whether or not you can retain me as an individual visiting your website or as an individual shopping from your e-commerce site or as an individual engaging with you in a conversation. That's how you create advocacy. If, I, if my experience is great, I'm going to be an advocate for your blog, your content, your business, the experience I've had, I'm going to go out there and say, hey, check out Lucas's blog, it's amazing, I learned so much from it. I'm not going to say the content on Lucas's blog is amazing. No, the experience, my learning, having visited that piece of content, my experience is amazing. So, value, right? Those of us in here who are familiar with Agile will know that we always focus on value. And likewise, we must always focus on value when it comes to thinking about content and experiences. Why am I... Why am I visiting your blog? Why am I visiting your site? Why am I engaging with you in conversation? You know, this, the, the value I get out of it is what matters. 
but then experience itself is a driver, is a driver for growth. And that's the end game, isn't it? How do we, how do we get growth? Growth in users, growth in individuals, growth in people, growth in our business and engagement. That's, that thing here is what drives us. Everything else is kind of like leading to this point here. And growth itself, it's a journey, right? And content acts like way markers in this journey. It's not, it's not this stuff that is important, it's the journey that's important. It's the experience that we, the, we, that we depart to our visitors, to our guests on our site, our blog, our digital properties. That's what's important. And that's what keeps us engaged. But content is noise, isn't it? I mean, how much content is out there? How much content can we, can we realistically, pragma, pragmatically soak in? It's just noise, so much of it out there. So where's the value? The value is in the signals. So how do you create signals? Signals is where the value is, and what should we, it's, it's what we should be working towards. Content shouldn't be created for content's sake. You shouldn't be on a platform just because you can be. For instance, for me, Second Life, when it was big, um, I was running a business and I got asked, are you guys on Second Life? And I was like, what the hell for? You know, my audience isn't on Second Life, so why should I be on Second Life? You know, why should I expend all that effort to be on something, to be on a touch point, and I'll come to touch points later, which is not relevant for me, because it doesn't create any signals for my users. So it's all about signals and not the noise. Pertinent content is what, what I refer to as signals. So content that is relevant for your audience is the signal. Now, pertinent content starts with interactions, right? So we have digital interactions, but more important than digital interactions are our physical interactions. How we actually engage with people, you know, offline as opposed to online. Yeah, online is also very important because both of these things create data. And then once again, it creates a lot of data. And then it's our job to, to extract the signals from that data that's going to help us better, better understand the individuals, the people that we are engaging with as our guests, our customers, as our prospects, etc., etc. It's all about understanding. So before you, before you start with like, you know, jump on and say, uh, What's the, the, the estimated value of this interaction? Forget that, just interact first. The value will come out itself. When we interact with people, you know, socially when we interact with people, strangers, say in a bar, we don't go, what value am I gonna get out of it? Unless you're a single guy, right? <laughs> but we interact for the sake of interaction because we're social creatures. So treat people that way as well. That's how you build bonds, not because you know what, I can sell something to Lucas. Hi, Lucas, how are you doing? Yeah. I run a Drupal agency. That doesn't work like that. Just get to know people. And that's what builds relationships. That's what helps you develop understanding. So, how can we improve our understanding? Firstly, it is innate. You know, we understand people. We innately understand people because we're, we're the same creatures, right? But there are tools out there. It's not rocket science. There are tools out there that can really help us in understanding individuals, in understanding brands, in understanding engagement, which all kind of leads to what kind of content are we going to end up creating. So I want to start off with something called an empathy map. How many people in this room are familiar with empathy maps? Okay, cool. Uh, there are examples of empathy maps out there in the hall. So I would say those of you who've engaged with it, thank you very much, like David and Sir and Zane. And those of you who haven't, do take some time to engage with them. There are three example maps out there, so you can see how empathy maps work at different levels across different uh, sectors, as well as an empathy map for the Drupal community. So an exercise I'm running is mapping the community's perspective on what we can feel here, say, about Drupal 8. Uh, I'm going to digitize it and share it with everyone for everyone's benefit. But engage with those. Just spend a few minutes looking at the different maps to get a general sense of how these tools work. So empathy maps can give you a view, 
at a stratospheric level, so at a very high level, you can use empathy maps to understand brands. Um, remember, brands also come from people. So if you want to understand a brand, you've got to, you've got to empathize with that brand, see what the brand values, and then engage with it accordingly. You can, for instance, we've got an example map out there from Canon done years ago. Uh, where we did an empathy map of understanding the brand and its pains and how we're going to solve those pains. Likewise, empathy maps can be used to understand a single individual user. So it's a tool you can use in your, in, as an individual. So for instance, if you're going for uh, a review, you might want to do an empathy map on your manager or reviewer so that you're connected. It's all about connections. You can also use empathy maps to understand socio-political movements. So for instance, the rise of the right. That's outside of work. That is something that is of great interest to me. The, the, the change in the socio-political landscape around the, right, uh, around the world. And I have extensively used empathy maps to try and better my understanding of certain movements in different parts of the world as to why is this happening. And it's, and it's bizarre when I share this with people in different sectors saying, hey, I'm using an empathy map to do this. And once they get the concept of it, they go, wow, it does actually improve our understanding. You can use empathy maps to understand conflict zones and how conflict and poverty affects individuals and how that changes the ecosystem. You can, so for instance, I've got an example of an empathy map over here of a street cobbler based out in Pakistan. Um, so another thing is, empathy maps doesn't come from secondary research. If you want to build an empathy map, what you have to do is actually get out in the field. You have to talk to people. You have to engage in conversation. You have to try and understand. It's about walking, not walking in someone's footsteps, but walking in their shoes, right? So how, how can we walk in someone's shoes if we, if we fail to wear their shoes and and engage with them in the same ecosystem that they exist in. So a lot of field work is needed. When I say a lot, I don't mean like you know, months and months, depends on the scale of the engagement, but you have to have those conversations on a one-to-one -one basis. So for instance, how does the empathy map work? You know, just giving you guys a general overview, you start off with the persona and what we know now. So it's strange because uh, that's an agile value. So those of you familiar with Kanban know one of the values is start with what you know now. So empathy maps actually start with that agility in mind that we start with what we know now. So you build a persona, but instead of taking a demographic and saying, you know, 30 year old male working as a street cobbler, no, you go and find yourself an actual subject and you talk to that subject. So you go, Rafiq, the cobbler, blah, blah, blah. So we're building a persona of an individual as opposed to a, a segment. Does that make sense? So we're not looking at segments, we're looking at individuals. <laughs> then you look at their current state. So where are they right now? Which is self-explanatory. It's evident where they are right now. You just look at them, you know where they are in this example particularly. And you think about the transform state. That's where the interaction starts. So where do you want to go, right? And you've got your end goal. You go, okay, so that's where, we end, we're, that's where we need to end up. And then you engage in conversation. So it's about what they hear. Not about what you hear from them, but what they hear about their current state and their, their problem world, their, their ecosystem from others, peers, yourself, the media, all the different channels that feed information to this individual is what you want to capture in terms of what you hear. Then you want to find out what they observe, what they see. You want to find out what, how do they think and feel based on what they're hearing and what they're observing. Because all those three things determine their behavior. It determines what they say and do, how they behave in society, how they interact with us as individuals. That helps us identify their pain points. Because only when we know their pain, we're going to know how we relieve that pain. So in essence, that is the structure of an empathy map. It's not, as I said, it's not rocket science. I wasn't formally trained in using empathy maps. Um, it's trial and error. It's inspect and adapt. Over the years that I've been using it for about seven, eight years now, 
I've become better at it. And I improve every time I build a new empathy map. So don't be, don't be shy of just going and starting one off. Like, one of the exercises I, I've, I've done is I build empathy maps with my teams based on an individual, say from QA, right? Because we don't tend to pick on QA every now and then, right? Be it UAT or be it developers or be it program or project managers. It's like, hey, this wasn't QA properly. Why don't, why don't get that individual's perspective of whether or not it was QA properly or whether or not what his or her ecosystem is like and the kind of poop we throw at them, right? So do that. Do it as an exercise. Just take your, your QA lead and say, John, I'd like to build an empathy map with you and I would like to start off with a conversation. Tell us what you hear about your function as a QA lead. And you hear things like, you guys always blame us when things don't work, even when the client changes the scope during UAT, somehow it ends up being my fault, right? So you see where this conversation is going. So try and do that exercise. So only when we better understand them can we, only when we better understand people can we build better content. Any disagreements on that? Do we all agree with that? Yeah? And only when we build content based on our understanding can we motivate people to join us on our journey. Right? Otherwise, we wouldn't know. There would be no connection there. You know, why would you join me on a journey if there is no connection, there's no motivation for you to do so? So, it's all about the journey. Once you've got people motivated to join us on the journey, we need to keep them engaged. Right? That's where you could say content journey comes in. So you've got the user journey, but there's also a content journey in there. That's where touch points come in. So how do we get the information across through different channels to these individual people who decided to join us on our journey. Every now and then we've got to feed the markers. So those of us who got kids are familiar with this question. Are we there yet? Right? Simple question, are we there yet? Is it touch points the same? It's always mom or dad, whoever's driving, kids in the back, are we there yet? So you've got to give them way markers before they ask them. You know? It's, we're half an hour away, or we're an hour away. They've got no, kids have no concept of time. So you've got to give them that content in their, in, in their own language, right? Uh, and it's, everyone's got a different style of doing that. Uh, with my kids, it's always 15 minutes, because the youngest, they have no idea how long 15 minutes is. And that's usually about half an hour later when the question is repeated, are we there yet? You know? So these are way markers. So you've got, to, you've got to decide on what your touch points are going to be. You're familiar with touch points, right? Yeah? Okay. But, okay, so just to get a sense of touch points, this is not a comprehensive list of touch points. But what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you look at this slide? There's a lot. There's a lot, right? What's that going to create? Noise, confusion, right? So we've got to, once again, thinking about touch points, always think, which ones are most pertinent to me? Which ones are the ones that I should be engaging with? Which ones should we invest in? Because if you decided to invest in all of those touch points, it's going to be super expensive to do, the, to, to do that. And secondly, maintaining those touch points is going to be impossible and it's going to create a hell of a lot of confusion. So you don't want to do that. You want to, you want to, be specific, you want to make specific investments of effort in your touch points. Why? Because it's all about the signal. It's not about the noise, right? So we want to understand the individuals we're interacting with. We want to understand which touch points, which journey are they traveling with us on. And we want to understand what are the way markers along the journey, right? So just as we're on a journey on a highway, we have informational touch points. In the old days, we just had boards that said the north. For those of us who've traveled up north from uh, down in London, I always find it funny. When you head up on the M1, it always says the north, as if it's like trying to keep you away from it. When you're traveling down, it's the south, right? Those are way markers. So you know, okay, Manchester's 200 miles away, now it's 60 miles away, etc., etc. Likewise, 
Uh, these days, we've got our phones and our GPSs that tell us where, how far our destination is. Likewise, you've got to invest in the right touch points to get the information across to, the, to, your, to the individuals, your, to your audience, that this is where you are in the journey. This is how far along you are. Because there's always an end goal, right? It might be, you know, shopping basket, it might be bringing someone back, it might be loyalty programs. There's always an end goal to your journey, why we're doing this. So you want to get that information across. Why? Because it's all about the experience. Without the way markers, there is no experience. It's just, it's just going down a rabbit hole, not knowing where you're going. Just like, for instance, uh, on the M1, if there were no way markers, we'd have no idea, other than the fact that we're heading up somewhere north, right? <clears throat> so touch points. Uh, this is from uh, the Canon experience. So we've got actions up on the top, and we've got the different touch points down uh, on the left-hand side. Now, the thing to note over there is there are certain touch points that the users interact with quite heavily, and then there are certain touch points where they're barely interacting with them. So the question is, why are we investing our money in there? Right? Because the, the, the way markers that the users are not interacting with, they're not creating the signal we want. They're just noise. They're just there. They're arguably wasted investment. Right? So the signals is what we want to invest in. We want to make sure that our touch points where we spend our effort and our money are exactly those that are the, the audience is after, the audience is going to engage with. Uh, one of the issues we had with this particular client going back years was the amount of confusion for users out there. The brand was confused. Their customers were confused. Because there was, no, there was no unified content. There, you call the support desk, they're telling you something else. You go to the online forum, they're telling you something else. Because they had so much content, internally they were referring to different pieces of content when it came to their knowledge pool. So one of the exercises was cut down the amount of touch points because, you know what, we've got to redo the content, and that's a big investment. Then we've got to maintain the content, and across all of these touch points, we just simply can't afford to do so. So, there's a guy called uh, Daniel Kahneman. Has anyone heard of this chap? Yeah? It's cool. He wrote a book called Thinking Fast and Slow. And in that book, he says that, that, that we've got two selves. Right? I'm sure we've got more than two selves, but we've got two selves. Uh, one is the experiencing self, and then one is the remembering self. The experiencing self is fickle. Yeah? We're along the journey, we see something, new and silver and, uh, and shiny, you go, woo. We're along the journey, we see something that we don't like, uh, but we're still on the journey. The experiencing self isn't the one that becomes an advocate, isn't the one that says, stay away from this product or stay away from this individual because the experience is bad. It's the, it's the remembering self because experience is a snap, is, 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 you can see, say, experience is a screen and memory is a collection of snapshots. So the remembering self does not remember the entire journey. It only remembers those snapshots, those touch points that really did reach out and touch the individual. So he says, um, the remembering self always decides whether you're going to be an advocate or not. Always decides whether that thing that we're trying to convey is actually connecting with the individual or not. So, Yes, the experiencing self is important because if the experiencing self is not having such a good time that they're going to fall off on the journey. So going back, keep them motivated to keep with you on the journey. But remember, when it comes to advocates, it's the entire experience that's going to matter. So if your first few touch points are not that, say your first touch point is great, so you've got me motivated, I join you on the journey, but then you're not investing enough in the, the intermediary touch points, the experience isn't going to be all that great. But at the end, it's a great experience, right? Your end touch point is brilliant. Doesn't matter. Why? Because my remembering self is going to remember all the bumps along the road. I'm going to say, yeah, they, they have a great product, but man, it was a rough ride, for instance. I'll give you an example. Um, recently, I bought a spiralizer. Do you guys know spiralizers? Yeah, amazing kit. I was like, wow, this is awesome. Uh, yeah. um, so you put like 
zucchinis in it, and you just kind of tan it, and it creates zucchini noodles. I was, I was like a kid, I was like, wow. I went through all the zucchini in the fridge. My wife wasn't so happy. <laughs> but the point is, the experience of buying that product was great. I looked at it, the video looked good. I was like, okay, that's exactly what I want. I ordered it, and then it was just a black hole. Obviously, I didn't order it on Amazon. I ordered it off their website. It was just a black hole. I kept contacting them like, dude, I paid you for two-day delivery. Where's my product? It isn't there. It arrived four days later. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. Not a great experience, but the product is great, right? Then uh, they sent me an email a few days later saying, uh, hope you got, my, got your product. And I'm like, come on, man. I got the product. I was emailing you that I didn't have the product. Now you're telling me that, you know, did I get the product? So it's, it's disconnected. So I had to buy another spiralizer uh, for my brother. So what I did was I went to Amazon. Why? Because I know what the experience is going to be like. Even though it's, I think it was about two quids more expensive on Amazon, uh, but I don't care about that. It's the experience. I ordered it on Prime, I had it the next day, and my brother was like, whoa, I just spoke to you about this yesterday. I was like, yeah, here you go, nice present for you. Right? So it's the experience. It's the, the, the remembering stuff. I remember not to order from their website because they were a crappy service. But I also remember my experience with Amazon, I sound like an Amazon salesman. My experience with Amazon was flawless. So I'm going to go back to what I know. Okay. So the experience itself is, is essentially the, the part of your brain that says, how do I feel right now? Is that kid in the car? Yeah, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? So, going to Euro Disney by train with my kids uh, last year, the are we there yet question was driving me mad. Why? Because it's like a four hour journey. <coughs> and the moment we got on the train within five minutes, the question started, when are we going to get there? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And then the remembering self. So my kids don't remember the, the anguish they put us through as mom and dad on the journey, but they go like, Euro Disney was awesome, when are we going back? <coughs> Right? <laughs> I'll be there. Right? So the remembering self is the one that we want to focus on. Right? And how, the remembering self is the one that says, how did I feel overall in that journey? Now, that's where empathy comes in. Because to know how someone feels isn't going to come from a survey. It's going to come from a conversation. It's going to come through interaction and engagement. The narratives are very important. And the continuity of the narratives is very important. So if you, you, you must have a good story to tell, right? Otherwise, don't bother telling the story. Continuity in that story is really important as well. So for instance, one of my, I think everyone's going to agree, one of my all-time best authors is Tolkien. Because the continuity of that journey, you know, I sound like a proper geek now, the continuity of that journey is just amazing from start to finish. Okay. So... Content landscape is changing. Can we agree with that? I think it's completely transforming. Content has become, content landscape has become pull systems. So we know pull systems, right? Why I say pull systems? Because we are empowered as users now. Previously, there was just push. There was the newspaper on the doorstep. You had a choice of four different papers. You knew which one was center, which one was left, which one was right. And that was really it. You had five channels to choose from growing up. You know, channel five came along and it was like, whoa, we got a fifth channel now, right? They were just push systems. They would push information out at us. The time we, when we wanted to pull something, we had to go down to the library. When we wanted to pull something from a really awesome resource, we used to go down to the British library, right? But now it's a pull system. It's like Kanban. I have so much options out there that I can decide which information, which content to pull and engage with and learn from. That brings in two things. One is noise. It's extremely noisy out there. And that brings in personalization. The need for personalization comes from the fact that, you know, it's, I can talk to all of you, but I have to address specific needs coming from you know, the empathy point of view, I've got to address the individual as opposed to the crowd. And when I've got to do that in mass, I've got to do that through personalization. And there are some amazing personalization tools out there. And I have absolutely <coughs> plug Acquia Lift as one of them, right? Jack's going to completely agree with me there. 
So the, the landscapes change. We're looking at pool systems, we're looking at a noisy ecosystem, and we're bringing in personalization. And there's a lot of science coming out of it as well. So sentiment analysis is another one. So there are two guys, I can't remember their names. Uh, somewhere in America, one of the educational institutes, I can't remember if it was Yale or Harvard or one of the others, but they came out in 2002 with an algorithm to, uh, to analyze sentiments of the written word. So sentiment analysis is exactly kind of what it says. It's essentially looking at the text and seeing what kind of emotional response that text is going to generate. And there's some pretty cool resources out there uh, that you can use for free. Um, I'm going to put them up on my blog. There's one in particular, so when I need to send a really arsy email to someone, I just go and do a quick sentiment analysis check on that, and it tells me it's arsy enough or not, or too much. <laughs> so sentiment analysis is something that, as, uh, you know, as groupless, as individuals, we should engage with, and we should inform our, our, the, our uh, our audience is about it. We should talk to people that are engaging with us as experts and say that, hey, here is this thing called sentiment analysis. Have you thought about that? Your content management systems, as uh, Jan was saying, it's not about CMSs. It's about value. It's about pulling us up that chain. Right? So if your customers don't know, customers don't know about sentiment analysis, whose job is it to make them aware of it? It's ours, right? How do we add value? In a knowledge economy, we add value by sharing nuggets of information that others don't know. That's how we add value. And these are tools that a lot of our uh, customers, a lot of people we work with, don't know. Why? Because they're just buried head deep in creating and generating content. For instance, for me, a great thing would be the addition of a sentiment analysis engine within the authoring experience for the back end. So when I'm authoring a piece of content, I know what the sentiment is going to be. Fair enough, sentiment analysis engines aren't there yet. So IBM Watts has one called Watson. And they say they're 70% accurate. I don't know where they plug that number out of, but could be. Maybe not. I don't know. Uh, maybe they'll get there. But the more we mix AI with, uh, with sentiment analysis engines, uh, with translation engines, the better we're going to get at it. So the point is innovation in content delivery is what we should be focusing on. Why? Because uh, going back to the team of Jam's talk this morning, it's about adding value. It's not about just delivering websites and saying, hey, this is a scalable platform. There you go. You know, have fun with it. It's about, because we want to retain that relationship, right? So if I've managed to sell something to Jeffrey, I want to make sure that I can upsell and cross-sell. So I need to keep bringing new ideas to the table. That's how we add value as knowledge workers. Knowledge, it's limitless. Our, the people we work with, our customers, may or may not have the time to go and develop that knowledge and evolve that knowledge. So we've got to be the thought leaders. We've got to keep an eye on what's over the horizon so that we can make them aware of it. We're, we're kind of like the, uh, the vanguard of tech, right? So we've got to be ahead so we can report back and say, guys, here's this really cool thing. Have you thought about it? <laughs> then there's emotional intelligence. Familiar with emotional intelligence? I EQ as opposed to IQ, right? That's another thing that you should be able to tap into. You should be able to tell your, uh, the people who are working on your platform, your content authors that, hey, other than sentiment analysis, think about emotional intelligence as well. Why? Because EQ, believe it or not, should, as should have been, but in our, is recognized as the most important kind of intelligence. It depends, it determines whether or not we can interact. What's the outcome of our interaction? So even before you interact, you should have some sense of the EQ of the individuals you're interacting with, and you should do an empathy map to get there, so that you can add value to that conversation, and you can get the value you want out of it. Right? And it's not a conversation for conversation's sake. Then there's engineered concept. Right? So Edward Bernays, uh, who I think was the grandson of Sigmund Freud, uh, came up with this concept of engineered consent. And it's been there since the, the 1950s. But the point is now... That was my timer. Uh, which is kind of cool because I'm on my second last slide. Now, 
we're seeing engineered consent uh, yeah, in our faces. So we all heard alternative facts, right? Alternative facts, what are they? They're lies that we buy as consumers and believe them as facts. That's engineered consent. So content has come such a long way that there are people out there, there are organizations like Cambridge Analy uh, Analytica and others who are using empathy, sentiment analysis, emotional intelligence to engineer consent. Some would argue to help people win elections when they shouldn't, right? Lucas knows where I'm leaning on this, <clears throat> but I'm not going to go there. So, to counter all of this in the landscape, we've got to inspect and adapt ourselves. Fair enough, not all of us are content authors, not all of us are engaged in generating content, but we know people who do generate content. So we should inspect and adapt the landscape to better inform those who are not in terms of where they should be going. So, in terms of the journey, Coming back, like just recapping, uh, it's the experience, not the content that's important. Um, you've got to look at connecting with the, with, with the individuals who are going to be your users or the individuals <coughs> who are going to be your customers. The way to connect is to empathize. You want to walk in their shoes, not in their footsteps. And all of these things will lead you, will enable you to create a more rich experience for the user for the individual you're trying to motivate to get onto a journey. So the, the kind of like key message I have is empathize with your fellow inhabitants of this planet. And I say inhabitants because it's not just people we need to empathize with, right? We need to empathize with everything around us that makes us better human beings. And I'd, I'd, be, I'd be doing a disservice if I didn't plug my own charity over here. So Peace Through Prosperity is an organization that was that came out of empathy for people like Rafiq, whose uh, empathy map is out there. So what drives individuals to become extremists, individuals to radicalize and go against the popular system? It's empathy. It was only through understanding why this guy is turning into what we don't want him to turn into. <clears throat> Were we able to say, those are the pain points. That's the pain we need to relieve. Right? So, have a look at this. You know, like, follow, have, check it out. Transform our world. Be Batman, but without the hate. Thank you. Uh, I think we have time for questions, Lucas. Okay, cool. Be yes. Batman without the what? Hate. Ah. Bad people. Yes. So, um, looking at your uh, Canon touchpoint diagram, yes, uh, couldn't make sense of how it worked. Can you just have a? It, it, that looked like noise to me. Okay. So, hang on one sec. Let me go back to the Canon touchpoint diagram. God, this is going to be you slow. Go past it. Did I just go past it? Yeah. Might be easier. Ah, okay. And again, that, yeah. So you've got your green dots. Some of them are kind of in the middle. Some are towards the left or right or top or bottom of the boxes. Okay. How, how does that work? So the, the blue dots are the decision points. So this, this individual has decided offline that he or she is going to go and buy a camera. So immediately after that decision, they're going to do a couple of things. So first one is always research. So when it comes to research, they're going to go to camera canon.com or camera.com or whichever brand that they're interested in. They're going to go on comparison sites. So, for instance, I went for a Nikon as opposed to a Canon. Why? Because I went to a comparison site, looked at it, and I was like, okay, most people think this is more usable for a novice. I'm going to go with this. Uh, the, other, the other touch points are like blogs. So I might have a favorite photographer. In my case, it was a mate of mine who's, who, who isn't a professional photographer, but he's got a really good eye. So for me, it was his blog about which cameras does he think work best. Then you've got social. Obviously, I'm going to go to social and check out the social media, particularly Instagram, see which cameras are people using, you know, phone cameras, or what, what are people using? So the green dots are interaction points. 
So after I've had a bunch of interaction here, I'm going to make another decision. So the other blue dot is I'm going to select something that I want to buy. And then once I've made that decision, the next decision obviously is where am I going to buy it from? Am I going to go online and buy it from Amazon.com or am I going to buy it from Canon.com or Nikon.com or whatever? Or am I going to go on eBay? Or I'm going to go down to a second hand store and pick up one that's slightly used because my god, these things are really expensive. Right? So these are all the research points. Now, once I've bought it, then I've got another decision point. So I've made the purchase, I've made that decision of purchasing. And then I've got another decision point, which is when I'm using it. How am I going to research and find out? Because, like me, I didn't read the manual. I looked at the manual, put it in the box, and stored it away. And about an hour later, I was like, uh, how do we use this thing? So I didn't refer to the manual. I went on YouTube. Yep. How do I use this thing? I, I want to uh, take, uh, what was it? Long exposure photographs. Right? I, yeah, it was in the manual because then I searched the manual many months later, but it's not where I looked. I went to YouTube again, long exposure photographs with this camera model, and it showed me a video. In two minutes, I knew what I needed to do. Likewise, moving on, there's another decision point, right, which is when the upgrade happens. So I've had my fun with a D51, but now I'm beyond it. My capabilities are beyond it. I want to actually capture video with some audio in it. So I need to upgrade. Where am I going to go again? So I might repeat the same exercise I did over here, or I might know enough people within the community where I go, I don't need to go and do a research because I'm just going to go and ask my mate who's got another Canon. He's got two Canon cameras. Maybe he can tell me what it is. Does that kind of help? Sort of. What governs the placement of, because I'm, I'm looking at the alignment. Your blue dots are all on the same alignment, and then your green ones are kind of placed at different places within the boxes. So okay, that so, so that's the strength of the sentiment. Oh, okay. So that's very weak and that's very strong. And this was built once again, talking to individuals. So for instance, social is, is high on research. So the more further right and up you are, the stronger the sentiment and stronger the interaction. So for instance, if you look at comparison sites, it's on the left, so it's not that strong. Why? Because you're tied into a brand. So when we were talking to individual, individuals who are looking to buy, we were like, okay, so you go to a comparison site, and they're like, yeah, we do go to a comparison site, but it doesn't really influence our decisions so much. Why is that? Well, because we believe in Canon, or we believe in Nikon, or we believe in something else. Yes? So I had to build one of these really recently, and this is uh, this, like, the strength and importance factor is hard to do in a visually, it's hard to make it simple to understand. So we actually went for the one dot, two dot, three dots okay. version, which, which, which makes it more quickly comparable. Mm -hmm. What are the arrows here? Is that just to show me that it's tied to that decision? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. So I think what I'm getting from this is that the dots Yes. So in that research one, it looks to me as the former, that's where there's more trust and influence on yeah. other consumers. Yeah. So other other consumers, yeah. It's a bit like trip advice. Yes. That kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. And the only way you get this is through direct interaction. So we were actually picking up on their own research when we were doing this at Canon. And their own research, we looked at it and I was like, uh, how do you get to this data? Oh, we sent surveys out. I'm like, do you actually talk to individuals? Talk to people? They're like, uh, no. I'm like, okay, we do that for you. And we, for instance, we had one exercise which was outside a used camera store in Tottenham Court Road. So anyone going in and coming out, you know, we, we were engaging in a conversation with them. And once again, the motivation, right? So they were like, why should I give you five minutes? Well, you should give me five minutes because the end of this research, your ability to decide on a camera brand and a model will be easier. All I need is five minutes, please. Obviously, it wasn't five minutes. You know? There are only a handful of people who said, you said five minutes like half an hour ago. <laughs> are and, we there yet? Uh, we're getting there. We're getting there. Any, any other questions? Yes. Um, so 